We were in the village praying, fasting, calling on God in a small room. It is a bit bigger than this room, just calling on Jesus. The the church was not growing. It was just this size, just filled up, but it was not it couldn't grow beyond this size. I didn't know that God wanted us to take root. We remained this that size for seven years. I, the revelations I preached that you heard, maybe through a tape online, it was from that place. With fire. But we did not grow for seven years. And I one anxiety came because you know, as a young man, you need to be able to provide evidence that you are not failing. <laughs> and God dealt with that flesh, dealt with all those ambitions, stretched us in the cave until we were not interested anymore. He was taking us on the journeys of death. He knew we did not have the strength to fight the things that will come against us if he makes us big in that state. We will serve ambition. We will become fake like the rest of them. We are trying to prove a point. Trying to ensure that you see us as a reigning Christ. Meanwhile, that's, that's the service of flesh. And my life will not be squandered to achieve that. So he was giving us death. The death took seven years. This was the scripture I gave in the seventh year. Has thou not known? Has thou not heard? That the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, he's never weary. And there's no such of his understanding. You expected an explosion, you expected an expansion in the business. It did not happen for seven years. And then you are just say, almost about to surrender. And I say, Had thou not known? Has thou not heard? That the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, he's never weary. There's no such obvious understanding. He's expecting that you heard. He's expecting that you know. Because if you know, you should not be surrendering. We were stretched for seven years. I said, what are we doing wrong? After seven years, I was not interested again. Let's just follow the Lord. Eh? Anywhere he goes, we just follow him. Forget about targets, goals. Those goals became the tool that Satan used to torment my soul. So I said, no more. As long as you are happy, I'm happy. Everyone is happy. <laughs> when it was no longer a pursuit of the flesh, no longer an ambition, then God's purposes began to spring forth. Oh, I know what it means when the Bible says it gives power to the faith. I know it. The spring of mighty was released from heaven. And to them that have no might, he will wait for you to get to that, that last stop, like Elijah, before he brings might. So that you will not say, you know, we know how to do this thing. You will have prayed a strange prayer. Then he comes to give you. <laughs> For the rich shall faith and be given. And the young man shall utterly fall. <laughs> but they that wait upon the Lord, they shall renew. That's right. And they shall mount up. Who told you that your womb is dead? I came to confront you today that you will see the wonders of God. Oh my God. Shall renew their strength. The same situations for which you can be anxious are the same situations for which you should pray. The accurate response to situations when you notice that you are overwhelmed and your capacity has been undermined, you are being called to the place of prayer. And you remain there, remain there until you have an answer. Notice, notice that scripture that we read. It says, be anxious for nothing but in everything through prayer and thanksgiving, coupled with thanksgiving. Make your request known unto God. And then the peace of God that passes all understanding. That prayer you made unto God, the response that God will give is not to take away the problem. That's not the response he gave. The response God gave is that he ministered peace in your heart. That peace he ministered in your heart was what quenched the fire of anxiety. Oh, you are not following. He ministered peace in your heart, and that peace became a guard for your heart and your mind. It means that when anxiety operates, it operates as a two, there's a two location operation: heart and mind. Anxiety is intelligent. So you can minister to your mind. Anxiety can pull your thoughts into the crucible of thoughts that will bring you utter defeat and reveal to you how defenseless you are. Anytime your mind becomes that active, 
Huh? Because that's where doubt comes from. It means that you are walking the journeys of doubt. If it's your mind. And if your mind becomes so active that it can sell to you the brand of defeat, so much so that you get to accept it, it is a proof that you have stopped talking. Because your speaking has more authority than your thinking. So if the devil can so... Okay. Uh, what's your name? That name. That name that you mentioned. Now, follow my instructions. Count in your mind. Count from 1 to 10. What's your name? Where did you stop counting? Four. You see, the moment you spoke, you stopped thinking. Meaning that your speaking has more authority than your thinking. So if anxiety can build this case and build an edifice in your heart, so much so that when you had the opportunity to pray, you, you, the first thing you mentioned is what? It is a no. It means you were not speaking. You stopped talking. So that report, that defeat began to build an edifice in your mind. And there's an extent to which the, the size of the edifice will get that you will believe it. There's an extent to which the size of that edifice will get, you will believe in that edifice, just like the prophet believed that it was enough. He can't take it. Have you heard that stuff before? I can't take it anymore. That's a man that has an edifice built on his inside by the teachings of anxiety, taking hold of his mind. So man can be strong on the pulpit. Or he can be assassinated by anxiety. He can be powerful in public. And it's moving in the Holy Ghost. But he can become a captive of anxiety. So this man runs away. He takes up. And the, the intimidation was so strong. The hold of intimidation was so strong on him. That he took his servant. Which is the only link to him. Took him back to his village in Beersheba. So if you are using GPS tracker to track him, you track him to his servant's village. And he got there in the evening. He got to his servant's village in the evening. He refused to eat. And he traveled all night. So that anybody that comes, even his servant cannot give intelligence. He, he was cut off from the radar. He has gone underground. He traveled all night. And he came to a place early in the morning and he camped under a juniper tree for a long time i studied that environment that elijah went to camp i studied concordances commentaries and all kinds of works of scholars to find why did elijah resort to that uncharted location when his day of trouble came upon him the reason was because that was where, that was Elijah's God zone. When he was a younger man, it was around those places that call again and say, are you seeing my trouble? The first question I need to ask you this morning is, do you have a God zone? If we were in Nigeria, I would take you to a place in northern Nigeria, in the heart of Islam. That was where, on the mountains of Kano. That was where God revealed himself to me in an encounter that I will never recover from. And I had the opportunity to visit that city some time ago. I climbed that mountain as a memorial. Yes, I met Jesus there. It was the encounter, that was when I started having visitation from angels after that encounter. Everything shifted in my life. So Elijah remembered that location, he remembered that place, and he made haste to retire to his God zone. When he got to his God zone, that was when he decided to sleep. So he didn't sleep all night. He was trying to make his way away from harm. Now, I'm wondering, because just yesterday you were, were in the Metro News. First cover page, the man on fire. What happened to Elijah? Now, I'd like you to take inventory of some of the uh, statements he, he made. Because the angel of the Lord came to him and woke him up. There was food and there was drink. The first time when the angel woke him up, he didn't tell him why he was feeding him. Say, rise and eat. <laughs> Hallelujah. He rose, he ate, he drank, then he went back to sleep again. 
The angel came the second time. He woke him up again. It was the second time when he woke him up that he revealed to him the reason why he was feeding him. Are you there? What I want to read now are the wordings of his prayer. He has arrived at his God zone. Then there was a prayer he made to God. Is the content of that prayer. I need to draw your attention to it. Now, please, um, where is that place? Verse 4 of First Kings chapter 19. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and requested for himself that he might die. I'm wondering what really happened in the heart of this man. This man is choosing death. I just wanted to feel the height of manipulation that had overwhelmed the prophet. Now, <laughs> he was so manipulated that he was made to believe that death was a better option than fight. He was so manipulated to believe that um, the God that he prayed to that brought fire down on the mountain was not strong enough to protect him. So I'm trying to find out at what point did he arrive at this level. I need to show you two tools that Satan uses to deflate even the strongest among our company. The first is called anxiety. So the Bible says, be anxious for nothing. But in everything. With prayer and thanksgiving, make your request known to God. So that you understand that the workings of God is involved. Instead of the fact that you had God in your marriage doesn't mean Satan will not come. But what it means is that when Satan comes, if you go to God, he will give you a way out. That's why we involve him. Are you there? Because you can fall in love under the Eiffel Tower in Paris without God. But when when crisis comes, don't call him. He'll say, Are you married? I'm not. <laughs> oh, you are. So you involve him so that you can call him. Are you there? You know, we have an agreement. The agreement is that no sound. Because the moment I hear, all I'm doing is waiting for the Holy Spirit to speak to me. Then I'll stop talking. Because the way of power is a way of hearing. The power gives the, the fly on the revelation and gifts. If you can hear God, then you're powerful. It is enough. It is enough. It is, you know. I don't know what you have ended before you came for this conference. We've evaluated you, felt. It is, you know. When you looked at the situations and circumstances, you felt. It is, you know. It is, you know. Then the next prayer point that resulted was, let me die. Why should I die? Because I have realized that I am not better than my fathers. They sought a better expression. They sought a better possibility. And they were met with stark defeat. In their passing, they confessed that they were insufficient. And the stories were handed down from generations to generation, From to my own generation. I felt I would make a difference. But now I've realized I am not better than my fathers. That was where Elijah came. When he came to that point, then he began to sleep. They sleep. You know, he, he, he was walking all night. He made these prayer points, then he laid down to sleep. The idea was he was expecting God to kill him in his sleep so that the thing just. So he said, If I'm going to go out, I want to go out in peace. So just slept off. <laughs> Have you already packed your things? <laughs> You packed your luggage, you packed everything, and now it's okay. Um, if you want to go out, you go out in style. So you just 
you write a, a note and put my say, and then slept. That if you are there, oh God, just take me in my sleep. That's the great prophet. That a few days ago he stood on Mount Carmel and bore witness to an entire nation. A nation fell on their face in repentance, and those in the valley of decisions cried out, The Lord is God. A revival had taken place for the prophet that triggered it. His prayer points were an abomination. He was deflated. He was drained. He begged for death like a favor and slept off hoping that he would sneak out in his sleep. Instead of meeting the angel of death to take him to the underworld, it was an angel he met. So based on his expectation, it was a strange manifestation. So he did not speak. The angel said, Rise, eat. And he ate. If you are desperate to die like that, why? <laughs> Hunger should be. So he, he ate. He ate. I'm still wondering. <laughs> he ate. He ate. And he went back to sleep. Okay, okay. They want me to arrive the land of at least with food in the belly or something. Okay. That was thoughtful of God. But he went back to sleep. After a few hours, the angel came back again and touched. The Bible says that if a man does not walk, he should not eat. But this man had not walked. And food was coming. It was the second time. In order for him not to be confused, that it is possible for you to be eating when you are not walking, the angel had to explain to him when the second dose came, why he was being fed. He said, arise and eat. Because the journey is too great for you. Not, the, not far. The journey is not far. The journey is great. The reason why we are feeding you is because of the journey. If it's all about your hunger, we would have left you to die. <laughs> we are not feeding you because of your hunger. We are feeding you because of your journey. The journey is too great. This was a man that prayed to die and he was being told of a journey. So this was confusion of faces. By the time he took the second dose of the bread and drank from the cruise, he did not know that it was angel's bread that he ate. I know you don't believe me. So, I came armed to, to show you that it was angel's bread. That was the same thing called manna. It was manna that he ate. Turn your Bible to the book of Psalms. Psalm 78 from verse 22 to 25. How I wish the Lord would give me utterance. I want to explain some things today. The reason for the explanation. In fact, when I'm explaining it, the Lord will come here. He will come. You see, because they believed not in God, not trusted, and trusted not in his, in, in his salvation. Next verse. Though he had commanded the clouds from above and opened the doors of heaven and had rained down manna upon them to eat and had given them of the corn of heaven, man did eat angels' food, he sent them meat to the food. What I may not have the time to explain. Is that one of the bases of interacting with heaven is food. It's possible for man to eat heaven's food. You know, I told you I don't have time to explain, it, but I have enough time at least to establish the case. You still remember the book of Genesis, chapter 18, when Abraham was in Mamre, and then God, in the company of two angels, came to visit him. Still remember? Abraham went back behind the house, commissioned Sarah to prepare a meal, and when Sarah prepared the meal, meal of physical food, brought it to God and his angels, and God and the angels ate man's food. That's, that's where it started from. 
That's Genesis chapter 18. Then in Exodus chapter 11, God invites Moses and Aaron. And the 70 elders to the mountain top. And he was the one that prepared the table at that level. So humankind came and ate God's food. It was also interesting to know that that was the... No, let me not trouble you. Not today. But we want to talk about the revelation of God. All right? We will start from Exodus chapter 11. Because by the time you go to the book of Revelation chapter 4, the appearance of God there is Jasper. Jasper. So the way God appeared... The physical stone called Jasper was what was used, the metaphor that was used to describe God. Are you? Oh, let's leave. It's okay. it's okay, no problem. All right. I don't even know why. Okay. So in, in the book of Exodus chapter 11, man now came and ate God's food. So the first time it was God that came and ate man's food. Right? So he now extended an invitation and brought men to the mountain top. And they ate God's food. So in heaven, there is food. I don't know if you still remember Jesus when he rose from the dead in the book of Luke chapter 24. He, he had his glorified body and he ate fish. Are you aware of that? Okay. Have you taken time to find out what happened to the children of Israel when they wandered through the wilderness and they were eating this manna? What changed? The other day I went to visit my doctor and he said, you know what? You need to change the way you eat. You need to change because, you see, this, these indicators in your health is suggestive of the fact that you are eating wrong. So you need to change the way you eat. Right now, I don't even know what to eat again. Yeah. <laughs> so my question is this. They were feeding on manna. So what, what were the manifestations? Because somebody says you are what you eat. So they were eating manna, angels, food. So what, what? Did you take time to check it out? Okay, so what, what were the things that you noticed in your study? Huh? Yes, the, the Bible says he brought them forth with silver and gold and there was no feeble among their tribe. There was no sick person. Just like Adam existed in Eden before the fall and there was no sickness. When they began to eat the corn of heaven for 40 years, there was none feeble among their tribe. Are you there? That's not all. There was no need for them to change their raiment because their clothes grew on their body. Last year, your, your shoe was size 41.5 and then in, in winter, it becomes 42. Oh, no need to change raiment. And meanwhile, there were no boutiques in the wilderness for them to go shopping like Bond Street in London. That's Bond Street. You know, I don't know anywhere else, but I know Bond. <laughs> oh, my God, or something. Bond Street. Well, I don't want to tell you my stories on Bond Street. So, so many things take place there. Hallelujah. Their clothes grew on their body. No need for a change of raiment. When Jesus was to be crucified, you know, his garments, a cast lot for his garments. Why? It was seamless. Have you ever seen seamless garment? There was no no journey. That's why I say I don't have time for that business. But I want to show you some supernatural things that were taking place. It was because of what they were eating. Now Elijah was about to be given a privilege. The privilege to eat angels' bread. He was expecting to die in his sleep. Instead, he was awoken to a menu that came from above. Are you with me? Yes, sir. You're not with me. All right, so since you're not with me, what we'll do? Yeah. I normally protest when my audience is not following me. They give Elijah angels bread. He took the first dose, he didn't know. Went back to took the second dose and he was told why he was being fed he thought it was to help hunger his hunger you know your hunger can remain but eat because the journey is to he prayed for death he was given a journey so at this time his understanding is unfruitful completely it was when he rose up to make the trip 
had it discovered that for 40 days he did not need food. And the Bible revealed that he walked 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb, the mountain of God. That means he was not sleeping. It was when he tried out himself on the journey that he found. So that food he was given was transportation. 40 days transport fare was what he was given. And when he stood up to make the trip, he moved 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. Exactly. Like I told you, I don't have time to, to... The emphasis is not about food. When I preach on the interactions between heaven and earth, that's when I will talk about food fully. Then I will introduce the scripture that says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears me and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him. I will eat with him so that he can learn how to eat with me. How he eats his food. That's why God ate human food. Because he wants to teach us how to eat his own food.